Reflections from Torch Trust, focusing on Christian faith and sight loss. Hallelujah, he is risen. Hello and a very warm welcome to this Easter Sunday episode of Reflections from Torch Trust. Now, this might be the most exciting Reflections episode of the year, as it's all about celebrating the joy of the resurrection. On today's episode, we'll be sharing a brand new retelling of the Easter story, featuring imagined reflections from some of the characters we don't often hear so much about, but who still have a very important part to play in the events of Easter. We'll be getting started on our Easter story in just a few moments, but first, friend of the show and former staff member, Susie James, is here to tell us her favourite memories of Easter. I have to say Easter is one of my favourite times of the year uh, in the Christian calendar. And I think that's partly because growing up we had so many different traditions around Easter. So on Thursday, uh, the Maundy Thursday, when we remember Jesus' Last Supper with his disciples, we would meet at church for a special meal. Um, everyone would gather together to, to share that meal. On one occasion, we had someone come um, and share what the Jewish Passover meant. And we had all the different elements of the meal and um, just shared in those traditions. And then on the Friday, because in Hemel Hempstead, there's a really strong churches together. We used to take part in the March of Witness. Um, all the churches would gather together and we would walk through the streets to the centre of town and at the bandstand we would have an open air service often led by uh, music by the Salvation Army band and we would just worship in public which is something we don't do very often and just remember what Jesus did and I can remember people would take it in turns to carry the cross um, at the front of the of the walk and then the cross would be at the centre of our worship and then as we finished we would hand out hot cross buns to people so that's really quite a special time and it's quite a somber time and, and the, the words of the songs are serious aren't they? they they make us reflect on the sacrifice that Jesus made for us and I think it's important to sometimes stop and acknowledge that because we can kind of just rush over that to the good news that he was resurrected but actually we have to dwell on the fact that it did cost him everything um, I was 18 when the film The Passion of Christ came out so I went to see it at the cinema and I just remember being just horrified by um, by the violence of the cross and just that picture of Jesus's suffering. And I remember just sitting there thinking, oh, my God, I never want to sin again. You know, if that's what it costs, Lord, I don't ever want to sin again. Um, and of course, I'm human, so that's not the case. But it just makes you think about sin and the, and the price that Jesus had to pay um, as that sacrifice on the cross. And and then I suppose there wasn't really any particular thing that you do on Saturday, but it is that time you're in that 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 waiting time. And if anyone's ever had family members that they've lost, you get that kind of waiting time after someone's passed on before the funeral. And then Easter Sunday, you know, is the turnaround. And we used to get up early and we'd go to the park for a sunrise service. And as the sun was rising, we would uh, listen to the readings of Mary meeting Jesus in the garden and sing those joyful songs um, and then we'd all have breakfast together and uh, especially eggs. Eggs always seem to be on the menu. You could have them boiled or fried or scrambled but it's <laughs> Easter eggs you know is part of uh, the way that we celebrate Easter in this country and um, you know it's just a really special time all those different elements coming together and I remember the couple who used to host those breakfasts Unfortunately, um, the lady, she passed away from cancer and one Easter Sunday um, after that had happened, her husband stood at the front of church and he was able to share his testimony of God's faithfulness throughout that time and, and to say, but you know, the best is yet to come. And that's always stayed with me, that Easter is that promise for us as Christians that though we will die in this life, um, there is that hope of eternal life with Jesus, that we will experience this new earth, the new heavens, the new earth, where there won't be any more sickness and there won't be any more sin and there won't be any more tears. 
Um, so I've always kind of clung on to that. And so every Easter now, that is particularly special to me. Now, as Susie reminds us, the entire story of Easter actually takes place over many days. On last Sunday's show, we heard about Palm Sunday and Maundy Thursday. So we're going to start today with the events of Good Friday, when all seemed very dark indeed. He carried a heart that was about to be broken. That was how he eventually died. He carried his heart open and vulnerable from Jordan to Jerusalem, from Gethsemane to Golgotha. And then it was broken, broken by the savagery of the death he was about to face, broken by the sheer uncompromising weight of all the other things he carried, but most of all broken by the love that brought him to this moment of self-surrender. Things slot into place, the halves of the cross are put together, nailed down, weighed down, strung up, but also lifted up, boiled in the heat of the sun, shifting his weight from nailed wrists to nailed feet, facing the tortuous choice between suffocation and rending pain, the last hours of his life begin. He looks again at his mother. She is just standing there, a sword of pain piercing her heart too. He sees the beloved Apostle John and a few other women from his group. Everyone else has gone. There is a terrible loneliness in dying. The hours pass. A strange overshadowing darkness creeps over the land. Suddenly there is a chill in the air. The noisy heckling of the crowd gives way to boredom and silence. One of the soldiers nods off. Some of the crowd start to drift away. The show is nearly over. Those who thought something spectacular might happen depart, disappointed, but not really surprised. There is business to be getting on with. The torturer's horse scratches its innocent behind on a tree. The agony is now at its worst. His temperature soars, his eyes swim. Disjointed, he heaves upward to gasp another breath. Everything is fading. Sweat peppers his body. Blood flows. He gasps with thirst, rasping and raging. I am thirsty. Carrying so much and the pain so great, and still the fear also raging, still fermenting, nearly all-consuming, that he is actually carrying nothing, that it is all to no avail. Who is it watching? Who placed this thing here? Who is waiting? Why this cup in this moment? Everything disjointed, stretching, his body starting to fail, falter, his ability to resist starting to fade, expiring, no longer carrying the will to live, abandoned now, the weariness from the beating, it takes its toll, it consumes you, now diminishing, the barometer crashing, the distant thunder rising, blood pressure falling, heart pounding, faster, faster, the end in sight, his lungs fill with fluid, gurgling, poisoning, it is like he has taken a big breath in, but can never breathe out again. He holds it there, is held there, blown up, kippered, racked. His body clinging to life, but the grip slipping. He will slide away now. He will be done with. This is the awful truth that dawns on the few who see him there. He cannot carry his life any longer. Death rattles in the parched emptiness of his throat, and eventually, crying out in thirst, the condemned man dies, his heart breaks. Then there is silence. His heart is broken for me. His love holds me to himself, and holds himself to that cross with a greater strength than any nail could ever muster. We are crucified with him, and we are carried by him. So here I stand. It is as if everyone else has departed, and I am alone at the foot of the cross. The day is almost over, and Jesus waits upon me. He looks at me with such tenderness. He won't make this decision for me. He just waits. 
And until that day when God gathers together all the scattered fragments of his creation, he will go on waiting. His offer remains the same. There is nothing I need to do to earn it or deserve it. It is just there, carried by this cross. I feel the weight of it. I see the extent of it. And I am faced with a choice. It is the same choice that every person faces or avoids. The same choice those criminals either side of him encountered as their lives inched towards death. Shall we sneer? Or shall we ask to be remembered? Let's take a moment to reflect. Alone at the foot of the cross, Jesus looks upon us with deep tenderness. We see how he waits, how he offers, how he gives us a choice, like the criminals either side of him. Will we sneer or will we ask to be remembered? Perhaps you might like to hold your hands in a gesture of openness to receive the grace and mercy and refreshing life that is still being offered for all today. Allow his life to pour into your life. See from his head, his hands, his feet, sorrow and love flow mingled down. Did e'er such love and sorrow meet? or thorns compose so rich a crown. Let's offer our heartfelt response to Jesus as we listen. Jesus' body is taken down from the cross. A poem written by Malcolm Geit from his book Sounding the Seasons. His spirit and his life he breathes in all. Now on this cross his body breathes no more. Here at the centre, everything is still, spent and emptied, opened to the core. A quiet taking down, a prizing loose, a crossbeam lowered like a weighing scale, unmaking of each thing that had its use, a long withdrawing of each bloodied nail. This is ground zero, emptiness, and space, with nothing left to say or think or do, but look unflinching on the sacred face that cannot move or change or look at you. Yet, in that prizing loose and letting be, he has unfastened you and set you free. We pray, crucified Christ, we draw near with awe to this holy place of Calvary. Here you transformed evil into the victory of love and violence into the victory of peace. On this painful and mysterious day, accept our thanksgiving for the cost of what you endured and give us the courage to stay with you until it is finished. Amen. And that was taken from the book the things he carried, and from our Lent Torch Together group. If you'd like to hear more about the online groups we run for blind and partially sighted people, do listen out for the contact information at the end of the show, or visit torchtrust.org. We'll be continuing our special retelling of the Easter story very soon, but first I'd like to share a moving reflection by Ruth Thomas with you. This was recorded by Richard Parry. Not for thirst or for hunger, not for the wound in my side, not for the hatred or anger or the prolong of time. It was Mary, the mother, the close of my father's eyes and hearts void of compassion. That's why I cried. We left our Easter story with the events of Good Friday, with Jesus crucified on the cross. But what happened next? How did his body come to be in the tomb? Let's now hear from a man known as Joseph of Arimathea. What more could I have done? 
Ha, that's a question I will never stop asking myself. I had opposed the council as much as I dared when they were calling for Jesus' death. To do any more would have brought suspicion on myself and my loved ones. The council would not listen, of course. It was like their path was completely set and nothing would change their minds. And so Jesus was crucified. The saviour of mankind, the wise teacher, brought down by people's fear and hatred. What more could I have done? I kept asking myself that question through the whole sorry spectacle. Finally, I realised there was something I could do. Oh, such a small thing, but truly all I have to offer. I asked Pilate for the body of my Lord. I know it was a dangerous thing to do. Such a request could easily bring unwanted attention as to my opinions of the dead king. I knew it could all too easily damage my reputation, but I felt I had to do it. I would treat my dear Jesus' body with respect and honour the way it should be done. Thankfully, Pilate agreed without asking too many questions. I think he was just glad to be finished with it all. Nicodemus the Pharisee helped me, and together we carried the body to the tomb I had had carved for my own family. I remembered the day I had seen the tomb completed. Back then, of course, I had hoped not to use it for many years. But now there could be no greater honour than to give it up for Jesus' sake. We wrapped the body in linen and anointed it with myrrh and aloe, as is the custom. I could hardly bear to look at that sad, wise face and soon felt the tears begin to prickle at my eyes. Nicodemus caught my eye and gave me a sorry smile. I knew he understood how I felt, how all of Jesus' followers were feeling. What more could any of us have done? Our work finished, we rolled a heavy stone in front of the tomb and I, I whispered goodbye one last time to my teacher and friend. As I stood there praying, I was hit with a realisation, a sudden certainty that there is indeed one more thing that I can do for him. I must keep telling his story. I must keep his teachings alive. I pray that God will show me the way to do this, that he will guide my footsteps in service of the Messiah. The next day, the high priests went to Pontius Pilate and asked him to have the tomb guarded so that none of Jesus' followers could steal the body and claim that meant he had been resurrected. They didn't want anyone to believe the words of Jesus. So Pilate tasked a guard to keep watch over the tomb. How did I get myself into this mess? I should have known it was a bad day when I was assigned to the night shift at the tomb. Talk about the short end of the stick. Of all the things I've done as a soldier, guarding a dead man's tomb is not high on the list of challenges. Do you get what I'm saying? The hardest part is staying awake and not because I need much sleep, but because it's so downright boring. I know the orders came from Pilate, so that ranks highly in importance, of course. And apparently I'm a favorite of his. Petronius, he said to me a few days ago, go with your men to the Garden of Gethsemane. We've been tipped off that we'll find this Jesus of Nazareth there, whom the Jews are so upset about. And does that ever feel like a long time ago? Anyway, as I was saying, Pilate asked for me again. Apparently the Jews were back on his case, still worrying about this Jesus, even though now he was dead. Petronius, Pilate says to me, take a guard, go and make the tomb as secure as you know how. Well, I know how to make a tomb secure, but all I could think of was, why? Not a question I get to ask in my position, but honestly, what are the risks? It's not like there was a king in there with gold or precious artifacts in danger of attracting grave robbers. Well, not that kind of king anyhow. Somebody said there was a sign above him that said, King of the Jews, but I thought that was just a sick joke especially when I heard that he showed up with a bloody crown of thorns. Besides, if he were a king, why would his own people crucify him? King or not, he was clearly not the kind of person that risked being robbed in his grave. He had nothing. Even his clothes had been taken from him. So why guard the tomb? Now, my fellow soldiers, Gaius, Manus, and Lucius, 
had been at the place of the skull, Golgotha, at the crucifixion, and had heard rumors from the Jewish leaders. To be honest, I was glad I was spared that part. I don't mean the rumors, I mean the crucifixion. I know other soldiers like that kind of thing, showing their iron will and brutality by hammering nails through hands and feet. For me, it's a little too close to home, you know? I mean, seeing a thief up there on a cross or a murderer, which of us hasn't engaged in something like that? Nope, participating in a crucifixion is not my cup of tea. Now, battle, that's another story. I'm as happy as the next guy to fight a proper battle. A battle has a cause and a purpose, not to mention glory and spoil. But this punishment by crucifixion unnerves me. I can't say it out loud, of course, but the thought makes my heart pound. There, but by the grace of my position, go I. As for the rumors, apparently the Jewish leaders had heard Jesus say that if his body were destroyed, he would raise it in three days. So they were afraid that Jesus' followers would try stealing the body and fake a resurrection. As if. I've seen those guys. They might be strong enough to pull in some fishing nets. But I can tell you it would take more than 12 of them to roll away a two-ton tombstone. So fine. About 30 of us went over there to get the stone in place and seal it. Then a bunch of us stayed for the watch, including some of the Jewish temple guard. By this time, I was feeling the weight of responsibility a whole lot more. The basic risk of falling asleep on the job as a guard is always there, but defending the sacred imperial seal of Rome adds another layer. Failing to protect it is also punishable by death. But how do I explain what happened on that watch? I cannot. I must not. I dare not. I was doing my job. We all were. In fact, our job was almost done because we had watched all through Friday night and all through the Sabbath, right through to the dawn of the first day of the week. The last thing I remember was a couple of women coming toward the tomb and then a very bright white figure appearing from the sky. His appearance was like lightning and his clothes were white as snow. He went to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it as the earth quaked violently. I was so afraid that I shook and couldn't move. But I could hear the shining being speaking to the women clear as day. He said, do not be afraid, which amazed me because I was terrified. Do not be afraid, he said, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. I know he said something else about going to tell his disciples and that he had risen from the dead and he was going to Galilee or something like that. But when I heard that bit, he has risen, my head started to spin. As soon as the women left, Gaius, Manus, Lucius, and I left the other guards and went into the city straight to the Jewish chief priests. We told them everything that had happened. I don't know what we expected them to do about it. We Romans were terrified of losing our lives. It didn't occur to us that the Jewish temple guards were twice as afraid. But when I started hearing the word blasphemy whispered, I realized they were cooked. Well, the chief priests were clearly stirred up and immediately summoned the elders. For some reason, they were more interested in shutting down our story than shutting down any lives. Imagine our surprise when they came out with a large sum of money for us guards and told us, you are to say, his disciples came during the night and stole him away while we were asleep. <laughs> now, money is all well and good, but what they were asking us to do was impossible. Surely they knew this would cost us our lives. However, before we could object, they promised that if this story about us falling asleep were to get to the governor, they would satisfy him and keep us out of trouble. So, hey, we took the money and followed orders. Well, that story spread like wildfire, and I don't suppose it will ever die down. It had better not, at least not on my watch. Well, hallelujah, Christ is risen indeed. But of course, the story doesn't end there. In fact, Jesus' female followers had a very important role to play in the next part of the events of Easter. So why don't we hear from Salome? 
It was with a sense of dread I woke up on the morning after the Passover Sabbath. You know that feeling you get when something bad has happened, but sleep has made you temporarily forget about it. And then, as you're creeping back into consciousness, in those few short seconds before you wake up, you remember that you're about to face something, though not quite what it is. The sense of dread increased as I opened my eyes and I tried to force them shut again, needing to escape into oblivion for just a bit longer. But Mary Magdalene had already seen that I was starting to wake up and nudged me. We need to get going, she said, and handed me a cup of water. Reluctantly, I sat up and took the cup from her. A crushing wave of sadness hit me as the cool water slid down my parched throat. He was dead. Jesus, the man I devoted the last few years to following, was dead. Never again would I look into his gentle brown eyes, so deep with knowledge and understanding, yet paired with an almost childlike curiosity and wonder about the world around him. Never again would I watch the satisfaction on his face as he ate one of the special cakes he liked so much and only I had the recipe for. Never again would I sit with him under the stars talking about philosophy and exchanging ideas and never again would I hear his infectious laugh when Thomas cracked one of his jokes. But for one last time at least... I would get to watch his peaceful face and I could perhaps pretend for a little while that he was just asleep. For today, Mary Magdalene, Mary mother of James and I were going to tend to him one last time in his tomb. I am Mary Salome, but please call me Salome. I used to live in Nazareth in a rather nice house with my husband Simon. We had no children. In fact, I lost three before I started showing. I know Simon was disappointed and I know he would have divorced me. But one morning he woke up with a fever and he was dead a week later. I was widowed and since Simon had only sisters, there were no marriage prospects for me. Then, one day, Mary, who was a great friend of mine, whose son had gone away to follow this new teacher, Jesus, told me that they were in the area and that she was going to go and see him. I joined, and after hearing Jesus preach, I decided to follow him as well. He had this way of making me feel whole again, like I was the most precious and important human being around I know he made everyone feel that way, but because it felt so individual, it still remained special to me. All my sorrows were gone when I was around Jesus, and life was easy, even though it was physically demanding to travel around all the time. Jesus himself was easy to get on with, and a smile was always lurking in his eyes, though sometimes I saw a sadness behind it. The night before he was arrested, he sidled up to me as I was stirring the soup pot and watched me for a moment before saying, keep being the amazing woman you are and never stop baking those cakes. Then someone else engaged him in conversation and the moment had passed. You know what happened next, of course. The supper, the arrest, the torture, and then... I was there during the crucifixion. I didn't want to watch... But somehow I felt like I owed it to him to watch when nails went through his hands and feet. And then when he called out to God that he had forsaken him, bent his head and died, something felt different. It was as if time stood still. Nobody said anything as we walked with spices and ointments towards the tomb where Jesus was lying. We were united in our grief and a silence felt comfortable. But as we approached the place, something was different. The air felt somehow lighter, in the way it does after a heavy rainfall. But there had been no rain recently, 
Then we all stopped as we were met by a most peculiar sight. The stone guarding the tomb's entrance, which had been so heavy that we'd needed help to roll it into place, had been moved. He's not here, Mary said, peering into the cave. I walked a few steps up to her to see for myself. Apart from the white grave clothes, the tomb was empty. Do you think grave robbers have been here? I asked. No, they haven't. The male voice made us all jump and we turned around simultaneously to see who the speaker was. And there, with a wide smile and a twinkle in his eyes, was Jesus. He let out his infectious laugh. It is finished, he declared. Anybody who believes in me will no longer experience eternal death. Please go back to the others and tell them what you have seen. He walked off and waved. And when we could no longer see him, we turned around and walked back with a spring in our step. And now I knew, despite what had happened, that everything was going to be all right again. The women went to Galilee to share the wondrous news of the resurrection with Jesus' followers, who at first would not believe them. They certainly seemed like they would need a good deal of convincing. But then Jesus himself appeared to the eleven. Let's hear the Bible now to find out what message he had for them. This is David Suchet reading from Mark chapter 16. He said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name they will drive out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up snakes with their hands. And when they drink deadly poison, it will not hurt them at all. They will place their hands on people who are ill, and they will get well. After the Lord Jesus had spoken to them, he was taken up into heaven, and he sat at the right hand of God. Then the disciples went out and preached everywhere, and the Lord worked with them and confirmed his word by the signs that accompanied it. We're very nearly out of time for today, but before we go, I'd like to leave you with an uplifting Easter thought for the week. This week's thought comes to us from Grace Dawson, our producer. Thomas was a brave, cautious and questioning soul. He was amongst Jesus' closest followers. When Jesus announced that he was going to a neighbourhood where recently an attempt had been made on his life, Thomas was first to say that he'd go with him. Days later, Jesus told his followers that he was leaving them, but that they knew the way to the place he was going. Distressed, Thomas pointed out that as he and his fellow disciples didn't know where Jesus was going, how could they know the way? The answer he was given was typical of the claims Jesus was making, statements that would be instrumental in his crucifixion, which was just hours away. The claim? I am the way and the truth and the life. Knowing that he was about to die and return to God his Father, Jesus said that he himself was the only way into God's heaven. Jesus says that truth has its very origin in him. Jesus was put to death because he made claims about himself which no other person had ever made or has made since, and performed various miracles to support his words. Who put Jesus to death on that first Good Friday? The connivance of religious, political and military authorities is the historical answer. Yet at a more profound level, it seems to me that whenever we reject the claims of Jesus, we, in effect, join in with the crowd on that Good Friday, the crowd that cried, away with him, crucify him. Jesus had said, I am the life, and on the following Sunday, he rose from the dead. Thomas was not present with his friends when they first saw the resurrected Jesus. He was unwilling to take their word on trust. He wanted to see Jesus with his own eyes and touch him with his own hand. Subsequently, Jesus granted this, whilst saying, Stop doubting, 
and believe. The humble Thomas could do nothing other than confess, My Lord and my God. Loving words of rebuke followed. Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Doubting Thomas was being taught that concerning the things of Jesus, the natural inclination is to want to know for sure in order to believe. However, God's way is for us to believe in order to know. The latter is called Christian faith. I'm sorry to say that we're all out of time for today. Thank you to Sarah Brookman, Lynn Davies, Linda Prickett, Keith Davies and Ruth Thomas for their wonderful contributions to today's show. And thank you for joining us on this joyful Easter Sunday. We hope you have a wonderful rest of the day and that you've enjoyed our special celebration. If you'd like to get in touch about anything you've heard on the show, then the number to call is 01858 438 260. That's 01858 438 260. Or you can email info at torchtrust.org. Until next week, from me, Marilyn and everyone on the Reflections team, goodbye and God bless and Happy Easter. You've been listening to Reflections from Torch.